So thank you very much, Dara. My name is Keen Fitzgerald. I am the security and defense researcher here at the IIA, and I'm very pleased to be moderating this YPN answering the, asking the question, is, our, is Ireland neutral? And I'm very happy, to be, very happy to be joined by Conor Gallagher, who's written a book of the same title. And, hope, as, uh, who, and Conor will be speaking for about 10 to 15 minutes. And hopefully, during that process, he'll be able to answer definitively whether Ireland is neutral or not. Just a bit of housekeeping before we begin. Uh, regarding the Q&A, if you'd like to ask a question once Connor has finished speaking, just simply raise your hand and a, mem and a member of our team will bring a microphone to you. This, this conversation is on the record, uh, both the Q&A as well as Connor's remarks will be on the record as well. Um, please feel free to join us on Twitter using the handle at IIEA. So uh, just to give you a little bit of information about Connor, uh, though I'm sure most of you know him from his writing in, in the Irish Times, Connor Gallagher is the crime and security correspondent for the Irish Times where he reports on issues concerning defense and state security, including developments in the defense forces and the rise of hybrid threats. He joined the newspaper in 2017, and he recently published Is Ireland Neutral? A book examining the involving definitions of Irish neutrality in the decades since independence and its future in an increasingly un uncertain world. He's a graduate of the DCU journalism program and has a master's degree in political communications. So, Connor. If you, if you don't mind, could you tell us a little bit about your book? And perhaps could you answer the question, once and for all, is Ireland neutral? Um, thank you so much for that. And I can definitively say that I won't be answering the question, is <laughs> Ireland neutral? Because despite writing a book about it, I'm still not sure. Um, I, I'm probably not selling the book or, or, or my, my contribution to the debate. But I suppose that reflects my conclusion um, that neutrality is such a flexible topic and such a, it's a, trying to even define neutrality can be like trying to you know herd cats it's it's there's so many definitions of it uh, globally and throughout history and of course Ireland has its own possibly weirdest interpretation of neutrality I was motivated to uh, to write the book uh, which I, I started just after actually Russia's invasion of, of Ukraine. So there's a relatively quick turnaround, but I'd been thinking about it for a while just because I, I, I realized that kind of this notion that I grew up with, that Ireland was an, always a neutral country, you know, in the vein of, of Switzerland, maybe a little bit more aligned with the, uh, the US and, and, and UK, but generally speaking, a pure neutral. Um, and then just you know, preliminary research, which made me realize that uh, only scratched the surface of, 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 of what was factually accurate. Um, and I suppose, you know, if there's a main takeaway from the book, it's that not that Ireland is not neutral or that Ireland is neutral, it's that Ireland has always had an incredibly complex and flexible relationship with the idea of neutrality. And I mean, just going back to the very foundations of the state, when uh, I, I think I start the, one of the, the first chapter off with this is, you know, just months after uh, the delegates signed the Anglo-Irish Treaty in London, um, before it was ratified and before the start of the Civil War, um, you know, we had the second in command of the National Army as it was then going to Paris to basically propose a military alliance with Paris. So right from the start, neutrality was not at all clear that it was going to be part of our founding ideals, even though it was discussed in the treaty negotiations before basically being discarded. Uh, then as obviously we move through the 20s, neutrality, the idea of neutrality is very much in the background as the country tries to find its foundations and find its feet. Um, we became involved in the League of Nations and, 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 and the, uh, the Coman Legal government probably doesn't get enough... Uh, uh, respect for, for, for actually the, the quiet but, but industrious approach to international relations and their work in the League of Nations in those early years. Uh, but even the idea of joining the League of Nations doesn't really correspond to neutrality because the League of Nations, much more so than the UN, was founded on the idea that if, if a member or if a country broke the rules, that the League would go to war, basically, um, to enforce it, its rules. Now, as it turned out, that none of that, that didn't happen. The League was intrinsically weak because the US wasn't a part of it and for many, many other reasons. And, 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 and you know, the Italian invasion of Abyssinia and the Japanese invasion of Manchuria showed de Valera in the 30s that the, the League was, was not really worth the paper it's written on. And that's where you get the real genesis of, or 
uh, our idea of neutrality when De Valera knew a war was coming down the tracks. Uh, he knew our we had a, a military that was not going to be able to contribute or effectively defend uh, the country. Um, and neutrality was basically a, a national security decision to keep the country out of the war. Uh, and it was a national security decision from a domestic and an international point of view because he was genuinely worried that we would have a civil war in Ireland if we joined the Allies. Um, this is only uh, 15, well, just under two decades after the, this, the civil war, um, you know, the IRA and Subversive still had a good deal of support to, old wounds were not fully closed over yet. So it's very easy to see how things could have gone south very quickly if he'd gone in with the, with the Allies. But even still, and this is one of the main, I guess, most well-known bits about neutrality, uh, Ireland's story is uh, its neutrality during World War II and the fact that we, sir, we had a, you know, to use De Valera's word, a, a certain consideration uh, for Britain uh, and most people are probably familiar with the, uh, <clears throat> you know, if Allied airmen crashed in Ireland, we would uh, repatriate them and us sending weather reports, say, uh, um, to the Allies, including the one sent from Black Sod Lighthouse, which persuaded Eisenhower to postpone D-Day by a day, um, you know, potentially ensuring the success of the invasion. Uh, but writing the book, I was really surprised by the other ways we assisted the Allies, uh, most particularly in, in intelligence gathering and, and the conclusion of the US and, and, and UK intelligence agencies after the war was Ireland was basically, in intelligence terms, a uh, combatant or a belligerent uh, in the war in that respect. Basically everything we had that was could have been of value to the Allies was passed on. Uh, to the extent that after the war, you know, they, uh, MI5 or MI6, whichever one is the James Bond one, uh, said, had a report, they had a history of, of MI5 during World War II and said that Ireland uh, being neutral or neutral was much more beneficial to the Allied war effort than it being uh, on the Allied side. Because if we joined the Allies, they reasoned, uh, we would have probably introduced conscription. We would have had uh, hundreds of thousands of Irish men uh, in uh, Defence Forces uniforms on the island waiting for an invasion that might never come. The Brits would have had to give us uh, anti-air weapons and tanks and, and all this sort of thing, which at the start of the war were in very, very short supply. Um, but because we were neutral, so hundreds of thousands of those Irish men uh, uh, were able to both enlist in the British Armed Forces and more importantly, enlist in the British war industry. Um, so they concluded that our uh, quote-unquote neutrality was actually the best thing uh, they could have wished for. Um, and then after the war, you know, maybe it's not as well known and it's becoming more well known now possibly, uh, this idea that we were going to stay neutral was by no means assured and that became very clear when the, 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 the early days of NATO being founded. Um, and we were, the inter-party government as it was then, was very keen or on joining NATO. They saw it as the best bulwark against the communism uh, threat. Uh, you know, at the time there were serious concerns about the Red Army overrun in Europe, um, like genuinely held concerns. And, uh, you know, Catholic Ireland thought that NATO was a good way to, uh, uh, to, to resist this. And, you know, the documents from the time um, show a great enthusiasm for NATO, but they also show um, this idea that we couldn't join NATO while partitions still existed. And so then you had the Minister for External Affairs, Sean McBride, who later became a, a huge critic of NATO, he was saying to, uh, so these kind of informal uh, approaches from Britain and America, uh, he was saying to them, we, uh, we want to join NATO, we'd love to join NATO, but we can't until you give us the six counties back. And he had been told that Ireland was so strategically vital to the to the NATO system that either the Brits would give the six counties back, and there was a Labour government in Britain at the time, and the Irish government had this idea that the Labour government weren't, didn't care as much as the Tories about Northern Ireland, but they thought even if the Labour government decided they didn't want to give the six counties back, the Americans would pressure them to give the six counties back. Uh, McBride's gambit failed completely. Uh, uh, the Americans basically said, absolutely not, uh, we're not going to uh, annoy our uh, uh, you know, our closest ally, Britain, 
Um, to them, Irish membership in NATO is something that would be nice to have, but by no means essential. And, and in the words of one American uh, senior diplomat, uh, just said basically to, America, to the Irish, uh, it, it's been nice knowing you. Um, but even that didn't, that didn't even signal the start of Irish neutrality as we know it today. Ireland still uh, went to the Americans and suggested a bilateral defence alliance uh, outside of NATO, but the Americans said no. If we offered that to you, we'd have to offer that to everyone, and then no one would end up joining NATO. So there the, the matter lay, and kind of, I started in the book at least looking at it again from a, 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 in the next stage from the Cold War perspective. And does neutrality apply to a Cold War is, is, is an even harder question to ask, but you know, in, in any way that mattered, we weren't neutral. We were very, very much on the side of the, the Western and the NATO and, uh, uh, and, and the Atlantic countries. Um, one early example was uh, Operation Sandstone, which was a survey by British forces of the Irish coast. And this would be if the Soviets invaded Europe and uh, the, 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 the Americans had to come over the Atlantic to take it back, they needed to know where to land in Ireland to take it back. And this was carried out with the full cooperation of the defence forces. The British coming over had to uh, paint their equipment in Irish Army colours and they had to wear civilian uniforms. It didn't work. Uh, <laughs> one reason it didn't work is the first time anyone in Ireland had seen a helicopter. So it was traffic jams uh, off a beach in Donegal of this British helicopter going back and forth and everyone trying to get a look. Um, but still, it didn't, uh, it didn't make the newspapers. So uh, it worked to an extent, I suppose. But sorry, I, um, I don't want to, I don't want to uh, take you through every little bit of Irish neutrality. Uh, but there was certainly, a, 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 in terms of espionage as well, we can see the, uh, the preference for the, the Western side. I mean, we wouldn't even let a Russian embassy be opened in Ireland until the 70s, uh, the early, or 74, I think it opened. Um, and we only did so uh, with great reluctance from some government ministers, including the Minister for Justice, who said, you complained you didn't have enough guards to monitor all the Russian spies who'd be coming in uh, with the embassy opening. Um, another interesting kind of uh, vignette I came across was this case of uh, Crinion and Wyman. And Crinion was a, a, a mid-ranking guard in the guard intelligence section. And Wyman was an MI5 spy who recruited Cr Crinion to give him very sensitive documents. And it's the only uh, instance I know of, at least, of a uh, Wyman was arrested and so was Crinion. And it's the only instance I know of, of uh, spies being actually arrested in Ireland uh, outside of World War II. And they were both put on trial in the Special Criminal Court, but the the Attorney General refused to hand over documents which would have been essential to the prosecution, meaning the main charges were dropped against them, and they were basically given a slap on the wrist and allowed to quietly leave the country. So you can draw your own conspiracy theories from that. Um, but um, I suppose then, uh, particular interest maybe to this group is, you know, joining the EEC as it was then in the 70s, it was always on the mind of Irish uh, governments when they were thinking about joining the European community that would eventually uh, conclude an armed alliance. And even go back to Saint Lamas said that, he said, you know, he thinks the final stage of the European project will be an armed alliance, if not a European army, but at least a NATO style uh, mutual defence pact, um, and actually Patrick Keating, who uh, me and Keane were, were, were talking about earlier, he was a massive help with the book, and he's a academic, or he's an academic who who has basically been the sole kind of researcher in the area of Irish neutrality for for many years. And he uh, he said to me when they when we joined, he was asked by RTE uh, to take part in a debate about joining the EEC, um, and he was asked to you know, comment on how it would affect Irish neutrality. But then RT lost the actual footage of it uh, before they could air it, and so they just did without, which maybe shows you how unimportant it was seen as to, to, to the debate at the time. Um, I just, I suppose I'll just finish up maybe with the odd relationship I've noticed in Ireland between neutrality and, and the military. And this appears to be pretty unique in, in, in the world, that we have an idea of neutrality that means 
not investing in the defence forces, not investing in any kind of, not talking about security or debating security, it being confined to a very niche topic. To the extent that, I mean, think about it, um, there's no RTE defence correspondent. Um, that's pretty unusual for like a, a Western country, or any country for that matter. Um, so that has been linked to a steady decline in defence forces over, well, sorry, it's not a steady decline, it's a permanent state of um, ineffectiveness, uh, which sometimes is more ineffective than other times. Um, and right now it's in a crisis period, you know, we're down past 8,000 uh, members. Um, there is a lot of debate and a lot of promises to address that. We've yet to see anything that will actually bring those members back up and, and the numbers are still going in the wrong direction as far as I know. Um, and this has led us to the, the, the situation where Ireland cannot defend its neutrality, whether you believe we are neutral or not. Uh, you know, we have the RAF have responsibility for monitoring Irish skies to an extent. Um, other, we're not able to police our own maritime zone um, um, because of our, our, our lack of ships and sailors. Um, so you've got this uh, weird idea of, of neutrality, which is not only uh, n not getting involved in any fighting, but not even being able to defend yourself, which goes against the, 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 the albeit scant, international definition of neutrality, which is contained in the, uh, the uh, Hague Treaty of 1907, which, 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 which basically says that you have to be able to defend your, your neutrality. But we will make, I maybe can finish by just saying before we go into the Q&A that the, the book, and I don't know if, uh, if anyone's read it, but it's not a anti or pro neutrality book. Uh, and I, I, I really wanted to take that position because to me, Neutrality and is is not a is not a moral position or it's not really an ideological position. It's a matter of foreign policy and it's what foreign policy benefits the country um, at at the stage they are at, they are at. So the version of neutrality we had in during World War Two was the the version that benefited us at the time. That's not to say we can't have a version now that benefits us or even abandon it completely if, 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 if it benefits the country. Uh, there was a, a Swedish gentleman at the recent international, uh, or forum on international security who I think put it very succinctly where he said neutrality is not a religion. Um, you know, it's not something you are blindly uh, obliged to uphold, but it's something that can be very useful in, in protecting your citizens and advancing your interests. Um, so. There's a couple of other bits, but we'll probably come to them in the Q&A, Keen. Fantastic. Well, again, thank you very much for this really, really insightful kind of reflection on your book. Um, just if anyone is interested, both, Connor, both Connor's book is also available at stores. I bought mine in Eason's. I don't have it with me. It's actually upstairs. I forgot it. Um, yeah, but also, yeah. if you're interested, <laughs> <laughs> I do have it. <laughs> but also, if you're interested in, in, in Patrick Keating, Patrick Keating uh, published a paper with the IEA in 2022, and it's available on our website if you'd like to explore this topic further. But I would recommend touching with Connor's book first. Um, so um, just ref kind of moving from the historic, historical reflections to, I guess, more recent history, which is to the Consultative Forum on International Security, I was just hoping to quickly ask if you could provide maybe what your sense of how the forum went was, and perhaps maybe offer a couple of reflections on how you thought that, and on how, what you thought the discussion was like, and maybe some moments which stood out to you, especially as you also chaired one of the panels. Yeah, um, obviously the forum, I think it was handicapped in one way and helped in, in, in another way. It was probably helped by the president's uh, uh, commentary on it, criticizing the makeup. Somewhat unfair commentary, I thought he said it was made up of uh, the admirals, the generals, and the the air force, um, and he did a little bit of a, a, a cut at Louise Richardson, although that might have been overplayed. But I do think that actually made people more aware of the forum and probably helped people tune into it. And I think if they did tune in, they would have been surprised by how broad ranging it was, how it wasn't actually a forum about neutrality. You know, neutrality was a thread that went through a lot of uh, the the topics, but. Uh, you know, there was really good insight into um, things like cyber defense, uh, hybrid warfare, you know, election interference, uh, the role of the UN and the role of the OSCE and, uh, and that sort of thing. Um, so it, 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 um, the president and maybe some other commentators, I think, did a little bit of a disservice by making it out to be kind of some government ploy to bounce us into, into NATO. Um, 
it was much more broad ranging than that. But I suppose I could kind of see the, the point of some of the critics of it that you know it was a it was a government organised forum. It was organised by civil servants, so they were always going to set the agenda. Um, at the same time, though, its critics probably spoke more at the forum than many of the the contributors. They were allowed to speak at length from the floor or whatever, which I know you might say is not the same as being allowed to speak from, from the podium. But there were also, it was criticised there was no pro-neutrality people on it. Well, like, there was a lot of pro-neutrality people on it. They just didn't maybe wear it on their sleeve. Um, you know, there's this whole dichotomy or this whole idea in Ireland that the debate is between pro and, and anti-neutrality people. It's actually very hard to find any anti-neutrality people or at least any people who are in favour of us joining NATO. That's not the government position. That's not the position of certainly most of the electorates. Um, you know, it's only maybe a select few who think we should we should join NATO. And I think the forum reflected that. Um, uh, I, I, I moderated one of the, 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 the debates, which was about the history of neutrality, which I, uh, I thought was really enjoyable. I thought it was actually going to be quite controversial because of all the protests and that sort of thing. But because I was just talking to academics and historians. Um, it was quite grounded and uh, you know very very interesting. And we didn't actually have to get too much into the hot button current topics of uh, you know of like partnership for peace or, or or the battle groups, the EU battle groups or that sort of thing. So I think it was a success. But as I said at the start, it was it was it was hamstrung by by by, by one thing, and that of course is the RTE thing, uh, the RTE uh, controversy, which just took all the oxygen from us. Um, which meant that it probably didn't break through or cause enough of those discussions around dinner tables, which I think was one of the main goals of the forum. Thank you. Do you have any questions coming from the floor? Um, this gentleman over here. Firstly, uh, thank you very much. Really interesting uh, talk. I suppose this isn't so much about neutrality, although there would be major impacts for neutrality. I'm not even sure if this question would have an answer. but. Traditionally, when we think of defense, we think of land, sea, uh, air, and so forth. But to me, and neutrality as well as you know, not sending troops, not being invaded. I don't think we're too much things being invaded, but cyber attacks. To what extent is Ireland as a nation defensively prepared for a large scale cyber attack? And if we aren't prepared, will that lead us further down needing support from NATO or some other non-neutral uh, bodies. Um, yeah, I mean, we, we have a, 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 a perfect real-world example of that with the HSE uh, attack in 2021, which showed we were completely unprepared. And that was a really unsophisticated attack as these things go. I mean, this is, these people were in the system for, for weeks and weeks before they were detected. And they were detected, but then they, people didn't take action early enough. Um, uh, and we did have to rely on other people. Not we didn't have to use NATO structures. Uh, and I think um, I'm not too familiar with the, the intricacies of the NATO treaties. But cyber attack doesn't even doesn't come under the the, the, the heading of Article Five anyway. The the Common Defence Clause. But there was a huge amount of reliance on other countries through bilateral uh, arrangements. Um, it did serve as a wake up call. You know they have uh, I think quadruple the staff in the National Cyber Security Centre. It's finally got a director now. It didn't have a director before because the, the, the salary they were advertising was far too low to compete with the private sector. Um, but you have, uh, and they have, one of the things they've been doing is been establishing or uh, solidifying those links with other countries uh, through NATO structures and otherwise. Like we recently joined a NATO uh, platform that shares details of malware attacks. Again, it's not becoming a member of NATO, but it's utilizing its tools. Where uh, became an, we've become a member of two NATO accredited centers of excellence: one in Tallinn in Estonia, which is cyber, and one in uh, Helsinki in Finland, which is hybrid, which includes cyber as well. And those are they, you know it, the people in charge would very much stress they're not NATO run. They're NATO affiliated and they're NATO accredited, but they're, they're not in the command and control structure uh, of NATO. And one of the, the lesser known ways we're assisting Ukraine actually is we've been assisting them in the cyber attacks. Uh, the director of the Cybersecurity Center, Richard Brown, said that in the Rockless Committee, I think, 
last month or the month before that we're assisting them with the knowledge we got fr from the HSE attack, which was carried out by Russian hackers, many of whom with very close ties to Russian security services. Um, so in that sense, we're already integrated into that. And uh, NATO membership probably it benefited us in some ways, but we're able to plug into that international expertise without being in NATO, I think. Uh, sorry, I don't know if that answers your question there. No, and what you were saying was very difficult to get definitive answer as well. Thank sure. you very much. Okay. Okay, um, so just to return to, I guess, something I noticed from, from reading your book, to, to prove that I don't have it, but I, I did read <laughs> it. Uh, so this is actually from the opening pages, which is you reflect on the words used to describe neutrality. You know, you have lots and lots of different words. You have permanent neutrality. But there's some interesting words that are used around Ireland's maybe specific character of its neutrality. The words, uh, I think, just to check my notes very here, quickly here, we have the words, um, you know, traditional neutrality, mm. Ireland being militarily neutral but not politically neutral. And I wonder, could you perhaps reflect on, in, in, your, in your view from the research that you've done, what, how can we best describe Irish neutrality? And I know it's not going to be contained in one word, but yeah. how best can we describe Irish neutrality as it stands today? Well, may, arguably by not calling it neutrality at all, by, by, by coming up with some other term that's maybe more descriptive, such as you know, non-belligerent maybe, but even that's not very uh, accurate because that would mean we'd have to be a war for us to be non-belligerent in. And you know, neutrality in the, in the legal sense, in the, the old strict legal sense, only applies during a time of war. Um, so you know, this idea of being a permanent neutral is something relatively new. Uh, when the government talks about our traditional idea of neutrality, uh, I think my argument would be we don't have a traditional idea of neutrality. Our neutrality has been in flux throughout the, fend or the history of the, the hundred year history of the state. Um, and, and, and it's increased to become narrower and narrower so to, to the point where now the government talks about our uh, militarily but not political neutrality. Um, which is based on the idea that we're not a member of NATO and we're not a member of, we're, we're not signed up to any kind of EU mutual defence pact, which doesn't exist, but we're not signed up to it anyway. Um, so it's a very, very narrow conception of neutrality. Probably be harder to, for it to be more narrow. Um, uh, uh, so, yeah, sorry, I'm not sure if that answers your question, but... Um, <laughs> Uh, yeah, I think we have the most narrow idea of neutrality to the extent that you could argue the term doesn't apply at all. Okay. <laughs> Perhaps raises some questions as well. Um, so do we have any more questions just coming from the floor very quickly before I return to some of my own questions? Uh, this gentleman in the front here, and maybe the gentleman afterwards, you might pair them if that's sure, okay. Sure, yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Thank you. Um, I was just wondering, in light of uh, having attended the consultative forum and in terms of recent events, do you think that does signal that the government is starting to take security and defence policy a lot more seriously, or do you think it's just going to be another report that will, you know, sit on a shelf? Um, Grant, do you want to? Yeah, thank you again for the, the excellent presentation and discussion. A very short question. Uh, based on our extended experience with the UN, the Security Council, and sending troops abroad, etc. What would be the overnight implications of us declaring non-neutrality essentially to the Irish state? Would there be any like major implications? Obviously, if we have, we're not able to defend ourselves anyway. But we'd be basically kicking the RAF out of our skies to say, no, we're not, allowed, we're not taking your assistance anymore, etc., etc., and all that. Um, so I'll just take that last one first, um, while it's fresh in my mind. Um, the if we were to declare overnight we're no longer neutral, uh, well, nothing would happen <laughs> whatsoever because neutrality is not enshrined in the Constitution uh, or in, in, in legislation for the most part. Sorry, it is defined in the Constitution in terms of after uh, Lisbon where it said we'd never sign up to an EU defence pact without another referendum, um, but there is no such pact, so arguably that doesn't matter. Um, so, you know, the only way our neutrality could <laughs> substantially change overnight is if uh, Leo Varadkar came out and said, you know, he took a plane over to Vilnius where the NATO guys are meeting and said, actually, we want to join too. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, which I don't see that happening. And, and, and that's because when people say that Ireland or the governments are um, really, really keen on, on joining NATO, like the question I always ask is why? What do they have to gain from it politically? I mean, every poll is 
up to 80% people say we shouldn't join NATO or we should maintain our neutrality. So there's no political gain from them. There's no financial gain. Quite the opposite. It would cost us an absolute fortune. Uh, you know, the, there's the, the goal of NATO countries having at least 2% uh, defence expenditure. Uh, we have 0.2%. The government has committed to raise that by 50% uh, by 2028, uh, which is a, a, a significant raise in IRIS terms, but... Uh, it still would leave us the lowest spending in, in, in Europe um, in relative terms, as far as I know. So I just uh, don't see it happening, um, either in the short term or the long term. Obviously, never say never, but uh, you know, I don't see public opinion changing on it, barring some really, really unrealistic scenarios, such as Russia, Russian troops parachuting into Donegal or something. Um, and the, 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 the first question there about will the report sit on the shelf, I do think the government are starting to take uh, questions of international security and defence more seriously. Some of that is down to maybe some subtle pressure from their EU allies. Um, some of it is down to a realisation of just how poorly defended and informed we are about those issues. And part of that was due to the Commission on the Defence Forces report, which found that we're basically uh, entirely unable to defend ourselves militarily from both conventional attacks and, and, and many of the more kind of hybrid forms of warfare uh, that people have been talking about recently. Uh, so they are definitely, and that was one of the goals of the forum, I think, to not just generate a report, but they were really, they were pushing it in the media, they were offering interviews with people, uh, they wanted it to get a lot of coverage. They wanted it to cause some debate, not even agreeing with them, but they wanted people to talk about it. Um, they achieved that to an extent, but unfortunately, a lot of it came down to a binary question of neutrality or NATO. Um, in terms of will the report sit on its shelf, it could easily sit on, on a shelf. I mean, uh, the, the, the chair, Louise Richardson, she's very capable. I'm sure she will put together a very good report, but it will have no binding power uh, it'll, it's, you know, it'll, it'll have much less impact than, say, uh, uh, the results of a citizens' assembly. Say, it'll be used to the government officials have made it clear it'll be used to maybe inform government policy, but not uh, dictate it in any way. So, it depends on what the political will is. But I could see it sitting on a shelf, absolutely. Uh, one thing uh, I think we might see coming from it is uh, it might be used as a as a basis for changing the triple lock, which, um, in case. Uh, people don't know is is this idea of that before Ireland can send more than twelve troops, armed troops abroad, it has to have the consent of the Dáil, uh, or sorry, the government, the Oireachtas, and uh, a UN mandate, mandate, which essentially means a UN uh, Security Council mandate. The government argue, well, that gives uh, a group of five of the most powerful countries in the world a veto uh, because the permanent five have a veto over all decisions. So that means. Russia, China, the UK, France and America can all dictate uh, our foreign policy, um, which to me is a very anti-neutrality or a very non-neutral position um, that you give another country uh, control over your foreign policy, but for some reason it's become very closely associated with the ardent neutrality camp. Um, so I've gotten a little bit off topic there, but I do think that's one change, solid change we might see coming from it. Um, something that um, something that we were discussing before the the event opened was um, Minister Ryan's proposal for an alternative to the triple lock, which um, I'm hoping perhaps you could explain a little bit to the audience and then perhaps maybe identify you know is that a viable option for us going forward or is this something you know what are the potential pitfalls of moving to Minister Ryan's proposal? Yeah, sure. Um, so the, the the Green Party has long been a staunch defender of the triple lock, and I think even a lot of its members still are very um, strong defenders of the triple lock. They see it as an endorsement of the, the the UN, an endorsement of multilateralism, and this idea of the rules based international order. Um, uh, but Eamon Ryan's kind of adjusting of that policy recently would propose that. We'd still have a triple lock, but the third lock could be replaced by, if I remember correctly, a vote by the UN General Assembly uh, or a, a, a mandate from another regional organisation. And that could be like the EU, of course, but it could also be the, the something like the African Union. Um, I don't know how 
workable that is. Um, the General Assembly don't really do anything in terms of establishing uh, peacekeeping missions at least without the Security Council, so that would raise some issues. Um, and you know, obviously if you're replacing with the EU mandate, the EU requires unanim unanimity on, on foreign policy decisions and CSDP missions. So you're just replacing one mandate uh, with another mandate um, and one veto with another veto, basically. Uh, although with an EU veto, at least, it would be a veto by countries you arguably share more values with than, say, Russia or China. But still, uh, you're still left with the problem that you're giving other countries a veto over your foreign policy. So. Maybe he has more detailed proposals about the intricacies of how that would work, but I think the devil might be in the detail on that one. Excellent, thank you very much. We just have a question from over here. Hi, um, in your book, you talked a bit about how, take Switzerland for example, a lot of neutral countries think that to be neutral, you need to defend that neutrality. Whereas in Ireland, we seem to have this conflation of neutrality with a weak military. Like, for instance, we're not funding defence forces. And it's very unpopular to fund the defence forces. I was just wondering if you came across any reasoning behind that conflation in the Irish public. Yeah, it's a, it's, it's a great question. I think it's really fascinating um, uh, 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 to look at the reason why we have such a, um, a low opinion of the matters of defence and, and why things like security and, and, and the military are an afterthought in terms of policy. I think you have to go right back to the, 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 the Civil War, basically, and the War of Independence, um, and, the, and the years after that, when uh, the, the department or the governments were scared of the military. Uh, like, there was a, a failed mutiny, basically, you could call it, um, where the uh, senior army officers were complaining about uh, being passed over for promotion and pay, and also not enough was being done to uh, uh, reunite or end partition. And that was back in 20, 1924, I think. And, uh, sorry, 1923. And so that was a really dangerous uh, point for the country. Um, and, the, and the government response to that was to um, basically fire all of those guys and, uh, and, and put new people in place. And then their more long-term response, and this was a response by the Department of Foreign Affairs, and, uh, or Department of uh, the Exchequer, basically, um, was to control the army by starving it of resources. Um, so they would never pose a threat like that again. And so the, they, po they, they passed an act, and the act itself is very boring, and, and, and it looks quite inconsequential, but it was called the Minister and Secretaries Act, the Ministers and Secretaries Act. And it basically gave the finance uh, line item veto over every bit of defence spending. So if the defence forces wanted to buy cable for a tele telegraph or a new bullets or whatever, they'd have to get approval from finance. And finance would basically be making military decisions for, oh, you don't need that, you don't need that. So you had all these situations, even coming up to World War II, when everyone knew war was coming, when the defence forces were saying, we need anti-aircraft guns, we need you know, defences here, and we need tanks and uh, spitfires and whatnot, and finance saying, you don't need those things, you don't need those things. And you know, basically, you had the bean counters making military decisions, which is not a good situation for, for anyone. And that just kind of continued. Um, you could say the peacekeeping, when we got involved in peacekeeping in the uh, uh, early 60s, late, late 50s, sorry, that represented a high point for the defence forces, but only from the point of view of burnishing our, our, our reputation on the world stage. Um, st still, domestically, we were, we were an afterthought. There might be some sign that's beginning to change, but arguably it's too little too late. I mean, you talk to some relatively senior military officers now and they're despondent, you know? They just see the organisation in free fall. Um, but, uh, I think you know. I think they could turn it around. I think they probably will turn it around. Uh, but there is a, a deep, deeply ingrained aversion in, in in certain sections of the civil service to matters of defence and security. Uh, just one question over here, and then we have another question over there. Okay. Um, this is just kind of a follow-up question from that. But I was just wondering. Obviously, Ireland's close relationship with the US and the UK is seen in 
amongst the public is a very positive thing in our foreign policy, but do you think that could have a bearing on this attitude towards the defence forces among the Irish public? And it's almost a sense of riding off the coattails of those nations that we don't need um, a strong defence force ourselves. Do you want to take that now? Yeah, or? sure. Yeah, Never. yeah. I, I, I definitely think there's a, a sense that uh, among the Irish people, and this is kind of speculation on my part, uh, but it's supported by the Poland to an extent that w w we know our friends will help us in a pinch, which may or may not be true. I mean, it probably is true. I mean, certainly, just to go back to the HSC cyber attack, our friends helped us um, uh, when we needed to get uh, Irish citizens out of Kabul airport. The um, Finnish and French uh, gave us space on their planes. The same in Khartoum in Sudan, we got help from, from European allies. So, you know, there, we have gotten, uh, we've gotten away with it to an extent. Um, you know, and part of that is because, uh, you know, Irish people are ge genuinely well liked. You know, the Irish officials have good relationships with, our, with, with, with their counterparts in, in other countries. Um, but uh, there's also the idea that, yeah, we do enjoy the more uh, pointed protections of, uh, uh, of our neighbours as well. Like, if you look at the recent polling about this deal we have with the RAF to kind of monitor and protect Irish skies, um, I think. 40% of people said they were absolutely fine with it. Um, um, and that was, and I think only something like 20% of people said they had an objection to it. And then the rest said they, they didn't know. Uh, so, you know, there is definitely a, a strong feeling that, sure, yeah, we don't need to, our, our friends will, will help us out. And there's a little bit of justification for that, you know. Because um, uh, they always have helped us out as, in, in, in as much as we've needed it. Uh, I suppose the only warning maybe or dark clouds in the horizon might be a uh, second Trump administration and the Americans pulling out of Europe or, 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 or disavowing the kind of protection of Europe altogether, then we might see a very sharp change in attitudes. Regarding very quickly about your, about kind of our partner countries and you know, with the idea that they would come to our defense, if so, could some of this be located back to the origins of the Irish state where we were in the original treaty that you know, looking after Ireland's seas and Ireland's airs would be with their, you know, would be under the remit of His Majesty's Imperial Forces. Is that perhaps something that, you know, the, uh, the situation we're in now, could that potentially be traced back to that or are these completely unrelated? I think, yeah, th th certainly maybe on an official level it could be, uh, uh, go back, uh, that the kind of, the fact of security being an afterthought probably owes, uh, in official circles, maybe owes some of its history to the fact that, well, up until the, mid thirties, uh, you know, Britain did protect us or not now there wasn't much to protect us from at the time, you know, it was a relatively calm period in Western Europe. But uh, yeah, I'm sure an official level it did. I'm not sure about a societal level though. Um, I think maybe it set the stage for just broadly speaking Irish society not to think too much about defence. And the other thing of course is our geography. Like, you know, we are really, really lucky, you know, about where we are in Western Europe. Uh, an island off an island um, and you know there's no reason we shouldn't play to those strengths you know there's a reason we don't need to spend two percent of our our our, our uh, uh, budget on the military and and, and 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 most of that is related to where we are so i think we just have one question over there thanks connor uh just maybe taking a sort of eu focus on things for a minute um, say under the Lisbon Treaty and mutual defence clause contained within the Lisbon Treaty and my query really as well, how do you have that on the one hand but then you also have going back to the time of the Lisbon referendum in Ireland when it was rejected the first time and uh, guarantees being given in the wake of that uh, initial defeat in a referendum that Ireland's neutrality wouldn't be affected but then you have a, a mutual defence clause within the treaty itself and the French uh, a number of years ago, actually, I think invoking that, like how in practice is that kind of stuff going to work out or, or what's the thinking at EU level as to having a mutual defence clause, but then whether it's and how meaningful it, it, it is in reality? Yeah, so the, the mutual defence clause, 42.7, I think, is, as far as I can see, written in such a way as to be meaningless, as in 
France invoked it after the Bat Clan attacks, but uh, the way they didn't have to invoke it, there was actually another clause that was probably more applicable relating to terrorist attacks, but they invoked 42.7, and they, a lot of observers think they invoked 42.7 to kind of give it a test run to see what it actually means and to uh, also to kind of generate a sense of European solidarity with France at the time. Um, so we, uh, we, you know, um, answered the call to arms in a way in that we sent troops to uh, Mali or Chad, uh, um, which relieved uh, French troops to, to come back to, to France or to go to, actually to go to Middle East to, to fight ISIS. So we contributed in an indirect way, even though the mission we contributed did have comply with the triple lock, so it wasn't too controversial. Other countries contributed by sending police. Um, I'm not sure if there was any direct military assistance or even if they needed military assistance. Uh, but we did so, and, and there's other countries in the EU which didn't contribute anything. So I think that that instance showed that the mutual defence clause, as it currently stands, doesn't have implications for neutrality as we see it. And also, there's the thing about you know they made us vote again in in, in the Lisbon Treaty, be, um, but they did they did polls after it and they discovered that the reason people rejected it the first time. Neutrality was there, but it was way down the list. You know, there was things like immigration, taxation, national sovereignty were much higher uh, on the list of reasons why they rejected Lisbon. And, uh, sorry, the most one was that the lack of information about it. That was the, the, the most commonly cited uh, reason for voting no. Um, but yeah, the, the mutual defense thing, uh, I wouldn't say it's not worth the paper it's written on, but it's certainly far, far away from a mutual defense clause. Just a question over here, then. Thank you very much. Uh, my question is on the pros and cons of uh, a country joining NATO. You've mentioned that, uh, obviously, if Ireland were to join NATO, obviously we would have to spend 2% of our budget on the military. So apart from that spend, what would be the other major disadvantage of joining NATO? Or in other words, uh, if a country, say like Ireland, were to join NATO, does it stand to gain more or lose more? I would say it stands to, hmm, I don't know. <laughs> it kind of goes back to the idea of that neutrality, I don't think is a moral question or an ideological question or should be viewed as an ideological question. I think we would have more to, God, I go back and forth to it actually like, I think more to lose, you know. Personally speaking, I'd be against joining NATO. Uh, and, and the most obvious reason is that Article 5, you know, you don't have control of your own foreign policy um, in certain very extreme situations. Um, and you are tied into a, a vast military apparatus. You do have to spend more than maybe you want to on, uh, on, on the military budget. And as I said earlier, you know, we're protected by geography to a certain extent. And I say a certain extent, in other ways, geography offers no protection, but there's no reason we shouldn't take advantage of that protection. And so right now, as the situation stands, I think neutrality would be a net minus for Ireland. Um, but ask me again tomorrow and I might have a different answer. Do you have any more questions from the floor? Okay, perfect. So I guess something that I've noticed throughout not only just the discussions around your book, but even just the discussions that we saw at the forum as well, is that there's always this, and this is going to maybe contradict a little bit what you've been saying, mm. but uh, there's always this tension between, I guess, idealism of how we would like the world to look and what Irish neutrality would look like in that context, and, and I guess pragmatism, and I guess we could call Irish policy in, in, during the Second World War pragmatism. And thinking about today and Ireland's not, not being politically neutral, but being militarily neutral, to what extent could we call that idealism, or to what extent could we call that pragmatism? I guess it's somewhere in between, but perhaps you could maybe shine a little bit more light onto that. I think the, the Ukraine situation offers a really good uh, glimpse into how the government is trying to maintain some links to neutrality as an ideological concept. Uh, and what I mean by that is we are contributing military supplies to Ukraine, something we've never done, well, sorry, we're contributing military 
equipment to a country that is at war with another country uh, for use in that war. And we've never done that before in the history of the state. So it's a huge change to, to this conception of uh, military neutrality or traditional neutrality. Um, but we are not, they're non-lethal supplies. So we're contributing things like, uh, we're contributing our, our pro rata rate of the European Peace Fund but our, our bit goes exclusively to uh, rations and body armor and you know fuel. Um, and it's, it seems to me that's where the ideology comes in and maybe it's kind of a, the strangeness of Irish neutrality comes in because we're putting body armor on, on, on Ukrainian soldiers to go into battle. We're putting fuel in their tanks, you know, but just because we're not buying the guns, does that make us any more or buying the guns or the bullets, does that make us any more pure? Um, and as well with the, uh, we're, we're obviously training Ukrainian troops as well. We're training them in uh, counter IED, ordnance disposal and, and demining, and also things like uh, combat medicine. And those are all noble things. You know, you're saving lives, you're clearing minefields for civilians, but they're also things that are essential to a, uh, army aggressive army operations and the Ukraine's counteroffensive that's going on right now. You know you need to demine a, 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 a field before you can send your troops across it to attack the enemy. So again, it's that kind of it shows that weird relationship with neutrality, and it kind of it's that idea of that neutrality is what we needed to mean at, at any one time, while at the same time still having still trying to maintain some line, some, some connection to, to neutrality, not just throwing it out altogether. Well, I think this is kind of also just connected to this idealistic approach to neutrality, and potentially in the sense of like the popular sense of Irish neutrality, and again, this also came out in the forum, was you know Irish neutrality allows Ireland to be an honest broker when it engages with the world. And we saw in, a, in, a, in one of the panels, we had a Norwegian individual and, mm. and a Swedish and a Swiss individual, and they talked about the implications of you know what, how could a non-neutral with a similar foreign policy to Ireland interact with, interact with the world? How could a neutral country, how does that imp impact their foreign policy? And I guess my question is, from, from your sense of, of reading things, but also I guess maybe looking at in the historical record as well, is you know, there's a lot of kind of declaratory statements of, yes, it means we're an honest broker, no, it doesn't. Yeah. And I guess perhaps you could weigh in a little bit on that. You know, is it sort of, is it sort of? Yeah, that was one of the more interesting things uh, in writing the book. Um, I spoke to a lot of diplomats and retired diplomats um, about Ireland's role uh, on the world stage and this idea of positive neutrality. You know, this idea that neutrality doesn't just mean shuttering yourself off in the world. It means going into the UN, negotiating arms control treaties. It means uh, sending peacekeepers abroad. It means, uh, you know, donating large amounts of money to international aid. And uh, it means helping to broker peace agreements, you know, uh, overseas, say in the Middle East or in Central or South America. And I asked that of basically everyone I, I interviewed. It was like, does Ireland's neutrality help us in that regard? And the answer was almost invariably no, uh, it doesn't. People don't, so when we're trying to maybe be a positive player on the world stage, uh, other countries don't, especially in the global south, don't view us as neutral. They don't know we're neutral. Or, and if they do know they're neutral, it's way down to things they think about when they think of Ireland. They think of us as a white, wealthy, country, an EU country first and foremost, um, us not being a NATO or us being neutral um, doesn't really come into it. If they do think of us in those terms, they think of us as a country with a history of throwing off uh, a colonial power. And that can be really helpful. And that can be really helpful in peacekeeping situations, say. So in, I interviewed one general uh, who was saying that, you know, in Lebanon, back at least before, before current tensions, you know, Irish people, Irish peacekeepers would get a much better reception than French peacekeepers, because the French peacekeepers obviously had a history of colonialism, including in the Middle East, whereas Ireland never had that history, and quite the opposite. So our history and our story as a, a non, as a colonized power rather than a colonizer, really helps us in that regard, um, but is of questionable usefulness when you're talking about being 
that kind of uh, moral power uh, in negotiating, say, arms control treaties. Like that, uh, the cluster munitions have been in the news a lot recently with the US decision to send them to Ukraine. And Ireland was at the forefront of um, negotiating that treaty on, on cluster munitions, the ban cluster munitions, which over 100 countries signed. And we held two weeks of talks in Dublin Castle uh, to kind of get it over the line. But there's a reason it was signed in Oslo and not Dublin, and, and Oslo was in Norway, which is a, a NATO member, you know, because they took the final lead on it. And so you can, a lot of these, you know, look at Norway as uh, a prime example, you know, you the Oslo Accords regarding Palestine and, and Israel. Again, uh, it's called the Oslo Accords because Norway led the way. Um, now, one thing, there's one exception to that, and that is the, the, the nuclear arms control treaties. So in the 60s, Frank Aiken was uh, a driving force behind the Non-Proliferation Act, which was, you know, hugely important on the world stage in limiting the spread of, of nuclear weapons. And people I spoke to said it would have been difficult to get that, to take a lead on that if you were a nuclear armed country or in under the, the explicit protection of a nuclear umbrella. So that's maybe one exception. But this whole idea of neutrality makes us a more moral person on the world stage, I think, is at least questionable. Okay. We're starting to run a little bit low on time, so I'd like to get some more questions in from the audience if we have any more. Uh, so we have one question there and one question there. We might start with this one first. Hi. I'm just wondering, hypothetical scenario, let's say it's October, it's budget time, and you had the opportunity to double funding in one area of defence, be it radar, cyber, and let's say that money couldn't go towards health or housing. What would you choose? Um, I would ask who put me in charge of that process. <laughs> and, uh, I suppose, uh, uh, going to my head, no pun intended, maybe the maritime, you know, that's, we're a maritime nation. We have a, we have a body of water seven times the size of our land to protect. We have four ships to do it and an ever-decreasing number of sailors in which to man those ships. Um, so if there was a, a way to throw money at the problem, um, it would be the Navy because, you know, and, and not, there's fishery protection, there's protection of national infrastructure, um, <coughs> and, and there's also the contribution we can make in the world stage to things like uh, Operation Irene, which we have sent, we have a ship over there right now actually, uh, but that, that, that leaves a big hole in our uh, uh, maritime defence at home. Um, so probably maritime, and, and even more so than land, that's an area that's been neglected by uh, the government uh, since the foundation of the state. I mean, the Navy was only officially founded in 46 or 40, 47, I think. Um, you know, where Air Force or Air Corps is older than the Navy, which is very unusual. Um, and obviously that goes back to the treaty ports and the Royal Navy uh, were responsible for, uh, for, for, for our maritime protection until the, 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 the mid-30s. But it also reflects a kind of sea blindness that we're, a, we're an island nation, but we often don't think ourselves, uh, of ourselves as an island nation. Thank you. This is a question over here. Yeah, thank you very much. So just going back to Russia-Ukraine conflict, obviously it was very much involved from the European Union side as well. So do you think that if Ireland decided to be pragmatic and follow the historical part of being neutral, would that very much affect the stand of Ireland in the Europe, as a European Union member? Because all the, all the European Union members, they know that Ireland is military neutral, but to me it looks like in this situation, it can be fully politically neutral. So what, what's your opinion on that? So if, 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 if we decided to give up neutrality, how would it change? And no, so if, if Ireland decided to go completely neutral and okay. not to be involved in any military support of Ukraine, I mean, as you said, not sending the mm. you know, armor and everything. So how would that affect the Ireland being as a member of the European Union? I think... It's not, it's not an area I, 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 I'm massively familiar with in terms of like relationships between EU member states, but I, I think it would be massively damaging to our, our stance as an EU member state. I mean, one thing, at least at the start in 2022, 
there was a, a huge amount of unity in the EU about how to respond to the invasion. And things like even the refugee uh, um, arrangements and the European Peace Fund being diverted almost entirely to support in Ukraine's military, the training mission being set up, and all the other one, the, 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 the non-military support um, that, that's been brought in. And that's, that's been maintained, as far as I can see, aside from some cracks maybe from Hungary. Um, uh, and I think for us to deviate from that in any major way would be hugely damaging and uh, in probably kind of more long-term ways as well as short-term, as in, you know, countries would be more suspicious of us, more, yeah, yeah, no, I think it would be hugely damaging. But again, not something I'm massively in, in tune with. Uh, just as we're running to our, to our, to our last question, um, certainly throughout the forum, but also in public discourse, we're, we've seen huge engagement I guess from the public, probably we could have seen more, but the news cycle overtakes things always. Uh, but we're seeing huge, much more engagement from all of the political Irish political mm -hmm. parties from across the political spectrum about what they would like to see Ireland's international security policy look like. So I guess, how <coughs> confident are you that this discussion will continue, at least at the political level, but hopefully at the public level? And what would you like to see happen to try and encourage greater public uh, attention and public discussion? on this? Is it perhaps a citizen assembly? Is it an RTE defence correspondent? Perhaps you can offer some select suggestions. Maybe an Irish Times defence correspondent. Irish Times defence correspondent would, would solve everything. <laughs> Just tell that to my editor. <laughs> no, um, I think the conversation is going to go on and I think it's, it has moved on a lot in the last, uh, mainly in the last year. And people are starting to wake up to uh, how defenceless we are in some ways and this, all, this whole idea of uh, how you need to defend yourself, not just from you know, kinetic military threats, but also this, this whole r range of hybrid threats. What I hope is that it, it doesn't just become this binary, you know, I'm against NATO, I'm neutral kind of thing, that we can actually put NATO to the side and everyone can agree, we're not joining NATO, no one wants to join NATO. How can we develop our security and defense aside from that, and we can have real practical discussions about it. You know, we don't need to buy fighter jets, or maybe we do need to buy fighter jets, but let's debate it on the merits of doing it, not on whether that's a controversial on neutrality, when the two things are totally separate things. I mean, uh, you know, so uh, yeah, I hope it can develop. I think it will go on. I just hope it goes on in an informed and kind of mature way. And the media have a responsibility in that regard politicians have responsibility in that regard. Like we've seen Sinn Féin, I think, uh, moderate their position on, on some aspects of neutrality, or sorry, I'm conflating military things now with neutrality, um, moderate their, 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 their stance on things like the EU battle groups, partnership for peace, um, at the European Defence Agency and, and that sort of thing, and also call for more military investment. So we're, that's a big development. You know, we've seen the development from the Greens. Uh, but then on the left, there's you know people who are saying who are criticising the government for buying ammunition or for buying um, uh, CBRN protective equipment to, to protect you from you know chemical or, or, or nuclear uh, threat. Like these are defensive things; they shouldn't be um, a contravention of neutrality to want to acquire them. Uh, so yeah, I just hope it continues in a more informed manner. Okay, thank you very much, Connor. So I think this is time. So firstly, I'd like to thank all of my colleagues at the IAA, Nisha with the microphone. We have Lorcan here doing the, doing the AV. Uh, and most importantly, I'd like to thank Connor for taking time to speak with us and to share an insight into his book, as well as some of his reflections on the, on the consultative forum on international security policy. Connor, thank you very much. Thanks, Amelia. <laughs>